Whenever Jesus is introducing himself in the Revelation, Jesus is focusing on something very important about his ministry. Oh, he does say that I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end. I am the first and the last, which means that Jesus is the one who started it all, and he's going to be the one who ends it all. He's the one who is creator, and he's the ultimate Lord God. He describes himself in that way, but the way he ultimately describes himself, and he wants himself to be known in the Revelation, is this. He wants to be known as the living one. In Revelation 1.18, he says, And I am the living one. He is the one who is alive forevermore. He was dead, it says, but is alive forevermore. He will never, ever have to face death again. He's alive forevermore. He describes himself a little bit different than that last song we sung. It was interesting that song said, "He wa who was, who is, and who is to come. When Jesus describes himself in the Revelation, he says this, who is, who was, and who is to come. Do you catch the difference? Jesus' emphasis is that I am alive forevermore. He is the resurrected Lord. He was dead, but he is alive. And when he comes forth from that grave in a resurrected body, he has a ministry that he wants to fulfill to those people of that day as well as to us. And in John chapter 20, if you'll look there, and John 21, I want to focus today on the ministry of the resurrected Christ. The ministry of the resurrected Christ. When Jesus comes back out of that grave and Jesus is alive, and he's going to begin to minister to those people that he has been walking with for three years, loving on, caring for, teaching all along the way, he comes back to minister to them. And there are three things that he does primarily in his ministry to them. And he also does that for us. He ministers to us in the same way. So whenever we find out the things that he does for them, we want to also apply to our lives that he will do this for us as well. The first thing I want you to see is found in John chapter 20, beginning in verse number 19. The disciples have locked themselves in the upper room. They're fearful, they're afraid, they have reason to be. Their Messiah, their leader has been crucified, has been abused and beaten, and now they think that they may be next. Listen to what happens in verse 19. When, therefore, it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them both his hands and his side. The disciples therefore rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus therefore said to them, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. The first thing that Jesus talks to his disciples about is he talks about the privilege of peace. When he comes in their midst, the first thing he says is, Peace be with you. I want to give peace to you in your heart. Two times he says to those disciples who've been behind those locked doors as he walked through those doors to get to them, two times he says, peace I give to you, peace with you. God wants to give you peace. And we, like them, have the privilege of peace. Now think about those disciples. Those disciples have been through a, a rough couple of days, hadn't they? They certainly had. They had marched in triumphantly with their Lord, expecting that now is the time when he's going to experience the coronation, and they're finally going to recognize how great and awesome he is, and they're going to finally put him on that throne. It's going to be great. But as we saw last week, a lot of things happened in that week, didn't it? And by the time Friday rolls around, Thursday night and Friday, you find the people are out there as he's going through trial, and as they say, what do I do with him? They cry, crucify him. They take him and they scourge him, they beat him almost to death, they hang him on a cross and he dies on that cross, he is taken and he's placed in a grave. Think about that, if you'd have been following Jesus all of that time, if you'd have been one of those who had given your life, you'd left your boats, you'd left your tax office, you'd decided this is what I'm going to do, spend all my life following this one who's going to ultimately be king and all of a sudden, in your, in your presence, you see that he has been scourged and he's been beaten. He's been hung on a cross. And not only that, you've also let him down. When you had opportunity to stand up with him and say, I'm one of his disciples, you have run and you've hid. Oh, it wasn't just Peter who denied him. Remember, everybody else ran too. 
And they all ran away from this one who had taught them so much and had revealed so much to them and had called them to be disciples. So they had this feel in their heart. They had, they had been defeated. They had let him down. They were disappointed themselves. They had watched him be killed. And not only that, they thought they were next. That's why they were hiding in the upper room. Don't you think if they're going to kill Jesus, the next thing they're going to do is to come kill those who are his disciples, those who followed him? Don't you believe that? In their hearts and in their minds, so many things are happening, along with the idea of what am I going to do now? <laughs> do I go back to the fish boats? Do I go back to the, to the uh, tax office? What do I do with the rest of my life? And all of those things happening in their heart, their life, their minds, and Jesus shows up and he says, I want to tell you something. I am not dead, I am alive, and what I want to give to you, what I want to impart to you, and what you have the privilege of experiencing, you have my peace. I want to give you peace in your heart. Peace so that you don't have to be afraid anymore. Peace so you don't have to be confused anymore. Peace so that you don't have to hide anymore. Peace in your heart. Peace with God. The peace of God. I want peace to permeate your life. And you understand why that's so important? Because when he was born, just a little baby, he came as the prince of what? The prince of peace. To come and to give peace into their hearts and their lives. I can't imagine what that was like whenever Jesus fills that room and his presence fills that room. And it goes on and says the Holy Spirit is imparted to them and fills that room. And they get peace in their lives when for a number of days they have been in a struggle and they've been hurting and had so many questions and so many fears, and Jesus gives peace. I want to hear, I want to, I'm here to tell you this. It's not just for those people of that day. It's for us too. Well, the greatest things that Jesus does, the resurrected Lord, the living one does for you and me, is he can give us peace. The peace with God, that we have right relationship with God. The peace of God that permeates our heart. The peace of God that allows us to have joy in our living and have an opportunity to be what God wants us to be. He'll give us peace. What about you? Do you need a little peace from God, the peace of God in your heart and life? We need that at times, don't we? Sometimes there are relationship struggles that we have where homes are broken, where things are not right. We're at odds with our family, whether it be spouse or whether it be children, whether it be siblings. We can have all kinds of conflicts. That's just because relationships of sinful people allow us to have that at times. And we can have things that bring turmoil in our life. What about finances? Do you always have more than enough? Or do sometimes your month is still there when your money's gone? The things happen whenever you don't expect them, that you got your budget all laid out. As long as nothing ever happens, I'm going to be fine. But something does happen. The car breaks down, the washer tears up. All those things that aren't supposed to happen, happen. And what am I going to do with my finances? What am I going to do with my future? What am I going to do with that debt that I've incurred? What am I going to do? Do you ever have a struggle with having things that are anxieties of your heart and your life that press in on you and trouble you within your spirit? You know what Jesus says, not only to the people of that day, but he says to us, listen, if you know the resurrected Lord, if you know the one who was dead is now alive, you know the Alpha and the Omega, the living one, I'm here to tell you, I want to give you peace. I want to give you peace. And so today, if you don't have peace in your life, this is all you have to do. I promise you this is all you have to do. You have to just talk to the one who's the giver of peace. And you have to simply say to him, I don't have peace in my life. I got a lot of turmoil in my life. A lot of things happen in my life right now, Lord. And you are the giver of peace, the resurrected, the living one. And I ask you, please give me that peace. You know what God will do? You know what Jesus does? Because he's the living one. Because he's here, because he cares, what he will do for you is he will impart his peace to your life. That's an awesome privilege of a child of God. Now, if you're a child of God and you're not experiencing the peace of God in your heart, you're not living up to all that God has promised you. You understand that? For God has promised to you that he will give to you peace. Does that mean that you'll never have difficulties in your life? No, I'm sorry, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean you'll never have a struggle in your life? No, it doesn't mean that. Does it mean that you'll never have a washer tear up again? No, it doesn't mean that. But what it does mean that in the midst of it all, He will give you peace in your heart. The ministry of the resurrected Christ, the first thing He says, you have a privilege of peace. The second thing He does, then He establishes some priorities. 
some priorities. The first priority, he says, is the priority of faith. The priority of faith. You find that beginning in verse 24 of chapter 20. Uh, verse 24 is whenever Thomas, you've heard this story before. Thomas, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came the second time. And the other disciples, therefore, are whenever they came the first time. And the other disciples said, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I shall see in his hands the imprint of the nails and put my finger into the place of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. What was Thomas's problem? He didn't have faith, did he? He was called Doubting Thomas. Now, before you start just categorizing him as Doubting Thomas, I want you to go back and read the story. The rest of them doubted too. <laughs> the women who had seen him at the, at the tomb, the empty tomb, they came and told the disciples, hey, the Lord's alive. They didn't believe him. Whenever the men who encountered him on the road to Emmaus came and they talked and said, hey, we met him on the road to Emmaus, they didn't believe him. So Thomas is not the only doubter. He just happened to not be there that day. I'm here to tell you, sometimes you miss out when you're not there. Amen? <laughs> he happened not to be there. I don't know what he was doing. I don't know what he was watching. I don't know where he was. But he messed up when he wasn't there. He missed seeing Jesus. But even though the rest of them said, we have seen him, I don't believe it. I don't believe it unless I have the chance to see it, put my fingers there. Boy, he's real bold. And unless I have a chance to do that, I will never believe it. He was a doubter, and he did not have faith. Well, God is so gracious. Eight days later, the doubter is there whenever Jesus shows up this time. Verse 27, Jesus says, Reach here your finger and see my hands, and reach here your hand and put it into my side, and be not unbelieving, but believing. Listen to Thomas. And Thomas answered and said, My Lord... And my God, he didn't even have to put his hand there, did he? Once Jesus showed up, he realized that Jesus was alive and he doubted no more, but he had faith. And Jesus goes on and says in verse 29, Because you've seen me, you have believed. But blessed are they who do not, did not see and yet believe. You know what he says a priority is? To have faith. A priority is to have faith. Whenever Jesus comes back and he's resurrected, he's going to walk here for a few days, and then he's going to ascend to the Father. He's going to be there with the Father until he comes again, and we're waiting for that. What Jesus wanted to teach those disciples is the importance of faith. You've got to have faith. A priority in your life is you've got to have faith. You cannot be a doubter. You've got to be one who believes in me. You've got to be one who believes in my word. You've got to be one who trusts in me. You've got to have faith in your life. Now, why would that be so important? Because this, faith is the means whereby a person is saved. Faith is a mean whereby a person can live a life that is pleasing unto God. Faith is the means whereby miracles happen and the will of God happens on earth that's happening in heaven. It's when the power of God comes out of heaven into this earth and to make an impact. What is the key for all of that? It's faith. And Jesus knew that. And so he encountered that disciple and he encountered everyone who was a doubter. And he says, come here and let me teach you something. Let me show you something. Let something build in your life where you have faith because you're going to need faith in your life. And blessed are those who do not see, who have not seen, and yet they believe. My friend, if you're going to be a Christian and if you're going to walk as a Christian and please God and see God do work in and through your life, you have to have faith. It's essential that you have faith in the living God. You have to throw away the doubt. If you are a doubter, if you wonder if this is true or not true, if you wonder whether the Bible is real or not, and whether it's really God's Word or not, this is what you need to do. You need to say, Jesus, I just need you to reveal yourself to me. If you will reveal yourself to me, oh, will he do that? He certainly will. Why? Because he's alive, and he's living, and he doesn't want you to doubt, and he knows you need to have faith. You just simply say, Jesus, I need you to reveal yourself to me so that I can remove all doubt and that I can have faith in my life. And just as he did it for Thomas, he will do it for you. If you're a doubter, you're never going to do anything in your doubting. But God wants faith built in your life. It's a priority in your life. And if you've got guts enough, if you've got guts enough to pray and ask Jesus to reveal himself to you, he will reveal himself to you. You won't have to worry about that. Oh, Brother Mac, what do you mean by that? He's alive. He's living. That's not a story. That's the truth. 
and he'll reveal himself to you. Oh, how would you know that? Well, ask the Apostle Paul. He was revealed to Paul, wasn't he? After he had been resurrected, he was revealed to Paul. Paul never was a doubter after that, I promise you. And if you'll just admit you're a doubter, and you'll be honest enough to ask Jesus to reveal himself to you, he will do it. And whenever you see the resurrected Christ, Thomas didn't have to put his hand anywhere. He just simply said, my Lord and my God. Whatever he reveals himself to you, you don't have to worry about it. You'll say, my Lord and my God. First priority is faith. Second priority is found in chapter 21. Chapter 21 is whenever Jesus is ministering to his disciples after they've decided they're going to go back fishing. You remember that? They said, Peter says, I'm going to go back fishing. Now I want you to understand something. When Peter said that and the other disciples said, we'll go with you, they weren't talking about going out there and just for leisurely fishing. They fished all night long. They were really thinking about going back to that life. Going back to what they used to do. Fished all night long, caught absolutely nothing. Till Jesus shows up and on the shore says again to them as he had before, Hey, throw your nets on the other side and what happened? They had a net full of fish. And they're pretty smart people. They're smarter than we are. Because after they had seen that once and they saw it again, one of them looked at the other and says, I think that must be Jesus. What do you think? And old Peter throws himself in the water and swims out to it, uh, swims uh, uh, away from the boat and swims to him to spend some time with him. And Jesus brings them and they have breakfast together. And after breakfast, Jesus then begins to minister to Peter. And in that ministry to Peter, it helps us to learn a second of those priorities that he has. For us and in us and through us in our lives. And he ministers to Peter this way. Remember, Peter was the one who denied him three times. Peter was the one who thought Jesus wouldn't care a thing about him. Well, well Jesus is the means of restoring him. He lets him know, I forgive you, I restore you. And then he calls him and establishes to him, for him a priority. This is what it says in chapter 21, verse number 15. So then, they, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than these? Now, we don't know what these were. It could have been that he was looking at the fish and saying, Peter, do you love me more than these fish that you spent most of your life making your living with? He could have been looking at the boat or the nets and saying, Hey, Peter, do you love me more than these boats and nets that you were tempted to go back to and make your life in? Or he could have been looking at those disciples. And he could have said, Hey, Peter, do you love me more than these guys here that you've been spending time? Peter, do you love me more than these? You know what Jesus is talking to me? He's talking about the priority of love. There's a priority of love. Not only in your walk with God, you have to have a priority of faith but the priority of love. Remember what Jesus said, they will know that you are my disciples because you have love for one another. You have love for one another. And he takes Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, uh, you know that I love you, Lord. He says, well, take care of my lambs. He goes and asks him again, do you love me? And he uses the word agape. Do you love me unconditionally like God loves? Before that time, Peter would have said, yes, I love you like God loves. But Peter knows he's not very good at that unconditional eternal love because he didn't show it at the cross, did he? So he just says, uh, well, you, you know, Lord, that I phileo you. I, I love you like man loves as best I can. Okay, well, then you take care of my sheep. And then he asks him again, do you love me? Do you really phileo? Do you love me as much as you possibly can in your heart? As your ability, do you love me that much? And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you that much. Well, then take care and love my sheep. Love my people. What is, what is Jesus doing? He's helping Peter to get refocused on that priority of love. It's all about loving God, loving Jesus, and then loving who? Loving others. He says, my sheep. That's what Jesus said in the commandments. There's two great commandments. One is to love God with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all that you are. You love God and then you love your neighbor as you love yourself. Two things that you're supposed to be doing. To love God, to love others. To love Jesus, to love others. And that is a priority. And my friend, I'm here to tell you, that's a priority in our life. And if you don't love God like you need to love God, if you're not motivated that you say, I love God more than these, you write in your life what these things are. What are these things in your life? Do you love God more than your family? Do you love God more than your money? Do you love God more than your position? Do you love God more than your power? Do you, do you love God more than these? That's what Jesus asks you. 
And if you don't love God more than any of these things, then you need to get along with the resurrected Lord and you just say, Lord, I want you to help my lover. I want you to help me. I want you to help me know what to love and see that priority and put that thing in right order. And then if you love God as you ought to, then you say, God, and help me to love other people, not just me. Help me to love other people and to care for other people and to give to other people. Lord, help me be about the business of tending those sheep, of loving those people. God, help me love people. I don't know about you. Is that easy for you? It's not easy for me. I'm kind of selfish. I'm sure I'm the only selfish person here, but it's kind of hard for me at times. I like loving me. Me and mine. Do you find it easy to love God? Do you find it easy to love others? Well, if you don't, then you, you, if you do find it hard to do that, you just need to get along with Jesus and say, Jesus, your ministry, your priority, what you said you would do is to help me to know how to love. Teach me how to love you and to love others. For the third thing I want you to see, he teaches the privilege of peace, priority of love and faith. And then he, he shares with him about a practice. He says, here's the practice. If you want to know what living the Christian life and following the resurrected Lord, here's the practice. It's the practice, he says, of following me. Look at verse number 19. Now this he said, signifying, talking to Peter, by what kind of death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, underline these words, follow me. Follow me. He says it again in verse 22. Jesus said to him, if I want him to remain, Peter to ask about John. What's going to happen to John, Lord? He says, if I want him to remain, that's until I come. What is that to you? But here's what you're to focus on. You follow me. Now, you know what the resurrected Lord said our practice is? Here's our practice. Our practice is follow Jesus. If you want to know what the Christian life is all about, it's following Jesus. Following Jesus. Jesus. Pretty simple, isn't it? It's no big formula. It's not some dissertation you have to read. It's not some book you've got to memorize. It's not out. I'm telling you, it's two words. Two words is the practice. You think you can remember memorize two words? You think you can memorize? Who thinks they can memorize two words? Raise your hand. I guess the rest of you can't even memorize two words. We will pray for you. I think most people can memorize two words. When I was a little boy, with my grandparents would make us say a, a verse before we go to sleep at night. And I didn't know many verses, but I know Jesus wept. <laughs> two words. I could get that one, amen? Don't you think you can get two words? Follow me. That's all he said. Follow me. Follow me. That's the Christian life. Following Jesus. Now let me tell you about Jesus and how he does things. First of all, he is not going to give you a road map. Everybody wants a road map. Lord, you just showed me everything's going to happen in my life and how I'm going to get there and whenever I go through the valleys and whenever the sharp turns are. And Lord, you just let me know all of those things and show me everything. He doesn't do that. Whenever he called Abraham to go to the promised land, leave his homeland, he didn't tell him how to go, where to go. He just simply said, don't lose me. I know where I'm going. You stay with me. You follow me. You'll be fine. Didn't have a GPS But he had the one who built the world leading him. And here's the other thing. He does not tell you the final destinations. Oh, well, ultimately heaven. But he does not tell you the destinations you have here. Whenever Jesus said to, his, to the, a gathering of people one time, I want you to follow me. Somebody said, Lord, I will follow you wherever you go. That's in the gospel. Wherever you go. Now that sounds like they're willing to go, but that's not what that means in the Greek language. You know what he's saying? He's saying this, Lord, I will follow you so long as you tell me where we're going. So as long as you let me know where we're going, then I will follow you. And Jesus' answer says, I don't even have a place to lay my head. I don't even have a home. I don't have a home to take you to. I can't take you to my home. I can't tell you where we're going. It's not where we're going. It's just simply follow me. See, Jesus is not giving you the opportunity to sign up if you like where he's going. You don't have that opportunity to be a child of God. He says this, you just follow me wherever I go. 
The three Hebrew children, that led them into the fiery furnace, but he was there with them, amen? <laughs> the key to this is not where we're going, it's making sure that he's with us wherever we go because we're following him and you will be fine. And he told those disciples, this is the practice, you simply follow me. Wherever I go, you go. Wherever I lead, you follow. My friend, that's what Jesus has for you and me. It's not our plan. You, you, you don't have the privilege to say, well, I'm going to do this and I want God to bless me. That's not a child of God. That's a lost person. You understand that? That's not, that's not what you're supposed to do. This is what you're supposed to do. Jesus, you lead me and I'll follow. Wherever you want me to go, what you made me for, and where you have me, you just lead me and I will follow. I will be obedient. I will do what you said do. Three things the resurrected Christ did. The privilege of peace. Man, that's a blessing. That's a blessing to have that peace in our heart. The priority of faith. Put away the doubting. The priority of love, loving God and loving others. And then the practice of simply following Him moment by moment. Those disciples heard were ministered to by the living one. And their lives were dramatically changed and they turned their world upside down. Our lives will be dramatically changed, affected, and we have an opportunity to impact our world when we will do those three, three things, experience His peace, the priority of love and faith, and the commitment that I'm going to follow Jesus. In my life, wherever I go, I'm following Jesus. Let's pray together.